Seasons change, water freezes, tires slip, and the person changing the radio in the car behind you can't find the perfect station. That's why there's AAA Auto Insurance. AAA insurance agents have been helping members get the coverage they need for over 100 years. Erratic weather? Check. Distracted drivers? Check. Being prepared for it all? Also, check. Get an insurance checkup to make sure you have the auto coverage that's right for you. Visit AAA.com slash checkup or stop by your local AAA store. TCL is a proud sponsor of the 1500 ESPN Studios. TCL, America's fastest growing TV brand. For those who simply can't get enough talk about the Vikings, we present Bonus Chatter. Bonus Chatter about your favorite team that's unscripted, unfiltered, and uninterrupted. This is another edition of 1500 ESPN's Purple Podcast. Oh, welcome to another episode of the Purple Podcast. Matthew Collar here with former NFL quarterback Sage Rosenfels who was at U.S. Bank Stadium yesterday to see the Minnesota Vikings take care of business against the Buffalo B- And that didn't happen. So the uh, one of the biggest upsets in NFL history by Las Vegas standards, the Vikings losing 27-6. to And let's just start with the big picture here, Sage. Uh, this loss means a lot to where their season could go. It could end up being... Basically, a swing game as they now have to go to Los Angeles and Philadelphia. Yeah, you know, when you, when the schedule comes out in the spring, you sort of look at your season. You're looking for games you definitely think you can win, games you think are going to be a huge challenge. You're looking for how many cold weather games you're going to have, how many games, you know, how many Monday night games, Sunday night games. You're looking at all these things. I promise you, every single Vikings player and coach and probably fan too, when they looked at this game, they thought to themselves, this is going to be a win, and then they're going to have that tough one on Thursday night, uh, you know, three or four days later. And uh, obviously it didn't turn out that way. Somehow, though, the sun still came up this morning. I woke <laughs> up. The sun was still rising in the east. All right. And we're still uh, only three weeks into the season now. There's still a long ways to go. And uh, we don't know how you know good or bad this Buffalo team uh, is. And we don't know how good or bad this Vikings team is right now. And uh, you have to sort of play the marathon game here. I think that the way we look at this one will entirely be shaped by what happens in the next two weeks. Because if they beat the Rams and beat Philadelphia, then it's back on track, blip on the radar. But if they don't, then you're looking at an uphill climb in the NFC North, which uh, you know still looks pretty strong to me after watching the uh, Detroit Lions take apart the New England Patriots last night. So... When you went back and watched this one, when you saw it live, I mean, is there any one area to point to that you would say, man, okay, that's that's where it all went wrong, or was it just a total no show? No, it was it was a total no show. I think I, I went and rewatch it this morning, and you go through each possession and each play, and you know, you could say the linebackers, and you could say Anthony Barr did not play well in a lot of different ways. You could say. Uh, you know, some of the, uh, the secondary players didn't play well. I mean, Xavier Rhodes has a situation where it's third and long, uh, but, uh, Buffalo has got the ball in the, you know, like the 42, 43 yard line. So, you know, Hey, don't give up that easy completion for the field goal. He backs off about 10 yards and gives up an easy completion for a 50 yard field goal, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, end of the first half there or whatever. So, I mean, it was uh, offensive line. It was quarterback missing guys open early. It was, it was fumbles. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a terrible punt, uh, you know, early in this football game. I mean, it was, it was everywhere you can think of. And I'm sure coaching too. I'm sure there are a lot of coach mistakes that we don't always see, you know, as fans and media people, uh, that, uh, you know, obviously the guys either weren't prepared or didn't have a, a great game plan, uh, to find easy completions or to shut down, uh, you know, their best players. But, uh, you know, this is the NFL. Uh, all teams have good athletes. And when teams don't show up, you're going to get beat even by the worst team in the league. Uh, and when you're what you are the worst team in the league and you do show up, you can beat anybody. That's what makes this league so fun. OK, explain to me, Sage, how you bounce back and how the locker room doesn't get lost after something like this, because this isn't this isn't just an L. I mean, this is a historically bad loss. I mean, one of the worst for Mike Zimmer, if not the worst loss that he's 
ever had. I mean, there are games that this sort of compares to, but with the Vegas line being 16 and a half, I mean, this one looks like a whopper. So if you're inside that locker room, you've got to be thinking, okay, we've got to bounce back pretty quick here to go play the Rams. But I think what we saw in 2016 is that losses like this can cause issues between the coaches and the players or the players and each other. Well, talking about, you know, losing the locker room, listen, there is a lot of leadership on this football team. There's a lot of guys getting paid. And I know for a fact that Spielman and that crew, they don't pay guys who aren't good leaders just because you have talent. You know, they're not just going to, you know, big, get the big checkbook out for you because, you know, they're looking for leaders of the football team to give that big cash to. And there's a lot of guys who are making big money. And those guys are all going to, you know, they're, they're the foundation of this football team. So they also all know that. Uh, most of these guys are veterans. They've been around. Sometimes you, you, they've dominated teams that were supposed to be pretty dang good and they've won by three or four touchdowns. It's like, man, what happened there? Mm-hmm. Well, this time they're on the other end of that. And, uh, it's a rarity. We haven't seen it much, uh, you know, as Vikings fans here, uh, in a while, but it, it's what happens. Sometimes you just go out there and just lay an egg. I mean, it, and, and, and everybody did. There's really no, no single person or group to blame. It wasn't just the offensive line. The offensive line just got exposed in this game because they had to, they had, they were forced to do something that is their, you know, the, of the two things, run blocking versus pass blocking. They're a much better run blocking type of team. But when you're behind immediately, you have to pass block for the rest of the game, which makes th- matters even worse because that is their weakness. And so, uh, you, you just have to move on and you have to move on very quickly. They have a Thursday game coming up in just three days from now. And it's an absolute, I and mean, they're all huge, but this is a huge game. It's going to be on the road, uh, you know, in Los Angeles and, and, uh, it's going to be a very, very tough opponent, maybe the best team in the NFL. Uh, so I think if anything, the best thing to do after a loss like this is to get right back on the plane in a couple of days and go out there, uh, and try to, uh, uh, you know, to try to play better. I think it's the best thing rather than waiting for a bye week and then trying to figure things out over a bye week and you're thinking about what went wrong and what went right. Let's go get a game plan together, and I don't care what the plays are, what the calls are offensively and defensively. Let's go out there and and, uh, and play good football versus the Rams. How long did it take you to get over a bad loss? Oof. Are you well, still not over question. it? <laughs> you know, it's, it, as it, well, as a backup, it's interesting. You know, that's the thing is you, if you're a backup like, like I was and you have a bad loss, uh, you know, I may not get another chance for months. You know, that's the thing is, you know, say it might be a one game thing and the starter comes back. Mm-hmm. You're sitting there thinking about that bad loss for, for a long time. I had that one time in Miami. Uh, I had a really bad loss. Uh, it, was, it was Nick Saban year and really fortunately about two weeks later, maybe even just the next week. Uh, I was thrown back into the mix. Gus Farratt got hurt. And after I had played this terrible game, I was, shoot, I was depressed on Monday. I thought my, my career was done and I got thrown back in and, and we brought the team back and, and ended up winning a, a big, with a big fourth quarter, three touchdown rally, uh, in that game. And so re- and here I am, I'm back, you know, my career's mm-hmm. back again. Yeah. I can, uh, next year I might have a chance for someone to sign me. But after about a week ago, I felt like, you know, no one would want me as a, as a backup quarterback. And so it's amazing how the NFL can be that way. I think as a player, you know, football is, I have a son who plays tennis. Football in some ways is like tennis in that each individual player, each of it, each individual point has nothing to do with the previous point or previous play or even previous game. Mm-hmm. They're, they're all sort of a, it's a new play. Uh, it's a new series. It's a new game. And that's how you have to sort of look at, look at football and look at this game is whatever happened our last game out. Is, 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 does not have to have any sort of effect on whatever the first or second or third play is in this next football game. The Vikings are a good football team. They just played as a group, uh, as bad as you can play, uh, and as bad as they'll play all year. I've always had a, a tennis hot take, which is I think that it's the toughest mental sport to play because there's no one to blame and there's no one to help you when you're out there. Like it's just a ball and a box, and the other guy, and you either beat the other guy, or you don't, and it, you know what I mean, like, it's, yeah, and football is like the opposite, there's so many variables, is it the quarterback, is it the line, is it the receivers, is it, you know, that's, that's probably why it's so popular on the radio, is you can sit and talk all day Mm -hmm. about what the issues are, and what the strengths are, and the weaknesses are, you know, a sport like tennis, it's like, well, he was not as good as the other person, and that's just the way it goes, 
Uh, but the, the unique thing about them is they're both those, they're individual play sports. Uh, and in this situation, it's obviously it's like an individual game and uh, you can't let these games affect you down the line. You know, the NFL is, it's a race, but it really is a marathon. Mm-hmm. You play them all, you count them up at the end and see what happens. The good thing is it does look like there's no team in the NFC North that's a dominant football team. All right. The, the, the Packers definitely aren't as good as they, you know, had been in the past. Uh, the Bears look better. Uh, and I, I don't, uh, I'm still not so in Detroit despite their win last night. I think there's going to be, you know, the, the, there might be a 10 win team that wins, the, wins this division last year. I don't think the Vikings are going to need to win 13, uh, to be the NFC North champs. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing after yesterday that, you know, when you look at it before the season, you could make a case that all those teams could win 10, 11 games. And then as we see it, uh, in play a little bit here, Chicago, I'm not sure that, uh, they've got the quarterback, at least at this moment in his career, to to make them truly competitive. And Aaron Rodgers being dinged up, Detroit, right? Definitely reason to not be entirely sold. Um, but let's let's switch gears, talk a little bit about Kirk Cousins specifically and, and his performance. My takeaway from yesterday was that he gave them no shot when their defense did not perform up to its usual snuff, and that is kind of why they got Kirk Cousins is that they felt that Case Keenum was not able to go tit for tat with another team if their if their offense was performing against the Vikings defense and he really let them down yesterday by not only not moving the football but the two strip sacks as well what did you diagnose happened on those two strip sacks well let's start off just right off the bat you know Kirk missed a couple guys a couple deep crossing routes i believe one was Adam Thielen and one may have been uh, dig just overthrew him and, and those are routes he just got a hit uh you know early in a football game at least one of the two i mean those are just missed opportunities they they don't show up on a you know a box score or something as a big play as a strip sack but those are huge plays when you miss guys early in football games uh when your defense is struggling a little bit your, your team's made some early first quarter mistakes and you miss some open guys for 20 or 30 yard gains you know th- those are can almost feel like turnovers in some ways. And I'm guessing that's how he, he's looking back and he's going, you know, if I hit those guys, man, it's a different game, mm-hmm. even just going into that second quarter. But he missed them and got the Vikings behind. And then we got put in a situation and Kirk got put in a situation where this is not his strength. His strength is not, uh, you know, playing from behind, uh, with a leaky pocket, trying to make plays. He's not a sort of a playmaker type quarterback. We saw that in Josh Allen. This is one of the reasons everyone loves Josh Allen on the other side or like him coming out of the draft is, I mean, we saw the athleticism when that pocket would break down on him. You know, he could scramble and outrun Anthony Barr. He did it yeah. twice yesterday. Yeah. Out One time he jumped over him, obviously, and the other time he just straight out ran him to the pylon. Uh, you know, that is, he's a spectacular athlete. Kirk, he's just not. He's not that type uh, of athlete who's going to, uh, you know, do all, be, be creative and, and buy all sorts of time. Uh, I, I always feel like the longer he's hanging on to the football, uh, you know, not that bad things are going to happen when Kirk Cousins hangs on to the football long, but usually it doesn't get better. You know, usually you want that ball out of his hands. He's usually a pretty accurate thrower. He's usually a very good decision maker. Uh, he understands coverages and the route combinations he can anticipate. But if guys aren't getting open based off of the routes that are called uh, and protections getting spotty, that is sort of a bad combination for Kirk because he's just not a guy who can create something out of nothing. He does occasionally, but it's definitely not his expertise. Why does he struggle with the outside pressure specifically? I mean, I know everybody does. <laughs> that no, no quarterback is just great when edge rushers come flying around like Jerry Hughes, who I think you know is really a, a great player. I mean, I, I saw him a bit in Buffalo, and he's uh, it didn't stun me that he was getting after the quarterback yesterday. But with Kirk, it seems like that's kind of his Achilles heel. And even in the first two weeks, there were times where – Rashad Hill just got a paw on somebody enough to push him off that might have been a strip sack. It, I mean, it, is it not stepping up enough in the pocket? Is it? I'm not sure what it is. 
Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience this football season. Tons of TVs, legendary appetizers, amazing fresh half-pound burgers, handcrafted sandwiches, and a wide variety of other pub favorites. The drink menu is awesome, too. Huge selection of tap beer, handcrafted cocktails, and the best Bloody Marys in town. Seriously, these Bloodies are awesome. Try the Bacon Bloody, the Jalapeno Bloody, the Mother Mary, or just get a flight and try them all. Plus, Lucky's 13 celebrates Sunday Fun Day. Happy hour all day long on Sunday, every Sunday. Events and prize giveaways during games, too. Lucky's 13 has locations in Bloomington, Burnsville, Mendota, Plymouth, and Roseville. Having people over for the game? Call ahead to Lucky's and order some of those legendary apps, and they'll be ready to bring home when you get there. It's football time at Lucky's 13 Pubs. Find them online at Lucky's13Pub.com. Lucky's13Pub.com. It's the most wonderful time of the year, football time. And Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience. Lucky's13Pub.com. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Is that I went back and watched the film this morning. It did look like the interior line did a pretty nice job of holding pretty firm. I mean, that's the key is you have to have the tackles sort of run those defensive defensive ends around, hopefully nine to, to upper to ten yards. Generally, your quarterback gets back to somewhere between seven and eight yards, depending on you know the drop. So he has to have a place to step up to. It did look like in the game there was a, the, the the center and the guards did a pretty nice job. Uh, of preventing uh, penetration, which allows the quarterback then to step up. And, and uh, so, yeah, there, there's definitely an issue. And, and, and as you said, we saw in the first couple of games, there's a, a lot of plays where defensive ends going right around the corner there uh, and just, uh, you know, maybe six inches or a foot uh, from her, her uh, hitting uh, Kirk's arm. Uh, it didn't really happen in those games. It did happen, obviously, yesterday. So, uh, again, that, that is not the Vikings' uh, strength offensively, and that, mm. that is a problem. It, you know, when they get behind, you sign Kirk Cousins because, you know, hey, we think he's a guy who can, you know, sort of happen in the Packers game. He's a guy that can bring us back. Uh, he's got a stronger arm. He's, he's you know, thrown for, uh, you know, 300, 400 yards many more times than a guy like Case Keenum is. You know, he, he, can, he can sort of put the team on his back. and uh, But he can't do it all himself, in particular when with a – with an offensive line that's not a great pass protecting offensive line. And so it was just a bad combination there of a quarterback who's not super creative. I mean, that's the thing we saw with, with Teddy Bridgewater, you know, three years ago. And we saw it with, uh, with Case last year. Those guys are better athletes as far as moving around the pocket, mm-hmm. uh, never staying in one place. Uh, Kirk's just not type of player. He's a better thrower though, yeah. uh, than those guys. And so, you know, that's sort of the magic thing that we have to try to figure out here. Uh, you know, the Vikings have to figure out is, you know, what are we going to do? Because we don't have a quarterback who can sort of make up for the small mistakes that our line has nearly as good as the last two guys that we had. So what was your takeaway on what happened on, on the defensive side, uh, especially with guys being wide open and creating big plays? I mean, that is just not something that we have seen in the past, especially last year. It was really rare to see somebody on a dump off pass get 55 yards running down the field with nobody around or to see Jason Kroom, the tight end with no one anywhere near him. I mean, it seems like there's some miscommunications going on that just generally don't happen under Mike Zimmer. No, that has not happened. And, uh, you know, maybe part of it was the athletic quarterback, you know, definitely on the dump off to the running back. I believe it was Ivory for what, probably about a 40 or, or so yard run there. I mean, that was a man to man coverage play. Uh, Josh Allen gets out of the pocket and he's a threat to run. I'm sure whatever linebacker he had got lost, you know, that had, uh, Ivory got lost and maybe was even chasing the quarterback. And then boom, the running back comes open. You know, what are you going to do? Do you let the quarterback run for 30 yards mm-hmm. or, or do you leave your man and try to tackle him? Uh, and then the quarterback found him. So, you know, that happened in the game. The, the, the touchdown, the wide open touchdown, uh, on the sort of wide receiver screen off to the right there. Uh, and then the, and then the tight end down the boundary. That is a college play. Uh, and Brian Dayball, the offensive coordinator uh, for the Buffalo Bills, who had come from Alabama mm-hmm. uh, back in the college game, actually previously the Patriots guy, went to the college game to Alabama under Saban, and then back now into the NFL. That is a college play. We see all these wide receiver screens. You see the tight ends and the, and the inside receivers, uh, you know, going out wide to try to block those corners and stuff. That was a situation where he went out wide to block the corner, uh, slipped him, uh, and, and then was up the sideline. And then the outside receiver cleared everybody out with a, with a post route 
that got double coverage. And uh, that was a really well-designed play. You know, obviously, it was somebody's fault uh, on that game, but uh, you know, on that play. But, uh, you know, really good design there. And obviously, something that the Vikings probably haven't seen uh, all that much defensively are those sort of fake wide receiver screens, those college-type type offenses. You know, that's the thing. When you play uh, a lot of man-to-man coverage, if somebody gets lost or somebody gets confused, it can make for a really, really big play defensively uh, or offensively because all the defenders have their, you know, their backs turned, they're chasing. And if one guy screws up, uh, it can make the whole defense look really bad. Is it just me or do they miss Terrence Newman a little bit in this way? Because Newman was so smart, so experienced that even though he wasn't the fastest guy out there anymore, he communicated really well. He was always in the right spots. And the guys that they have playing in the nickel corner position are not experienced. Mike Hughes and Mackenzie Alexander. And last week we saw Jimmy Graham running wide open a few times and Mike Zimmer benched Mackenzie Alexander briefly. Like it, it seems like because the Vikings have had really good nickel corners, Captain Munnerlin and then Terrence Newman, uh, maybe we underestimate how important that position is. Well, it's huge. It's a huge uh, importance just because so many teams run three wide receiver sets in the NFL. Mm-hmm. It, it seems like it's about 50 percent of the plays anymore, three wide receivers, which means you got to have three good corners and especially a guy in the slot who you're asked to do a lot of things or asked to sort of be a little bit of a linebacker and, and be in there for the run stopping. You're near the line of scrimmage, uh, but also be a guy who can, you know, be a really, really good man to man type corner because you're getting all that slot work, you know, in particular on third downs when a lot of times teams like, like the Vikings do with Adam Thielen, they put their best receivers in those slots to get those best matchups versus those nickel guys. Right now, the Vikings have two young guys in that position. Uh, they're sort of learning by fire here. They're both very talented. But yeah, it's nice to have those, that experience. Before we wrap up here, let me ask you this uh, about something else that happened in the league on Sunday. The I don't know if you saw this, but the uh, Arizona Cardinals decided to bench Sam Bradford for the last drive when they were down 16-14 to 14 to the Chicago Bears to give Josh Rosen his NFL debut, which is now unfortunately playing on my computer. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Uh, the autoplay highlights get me again. Uh, so, so Josh Rosen comes in the game with just a few minutes left, basically to try and lead a final drive. He ends up throwing an interception. The game's over. The Arizona Cardinals lose. Did, do you like that idea of throwing a guy into the fire like that? Or did you think maybe they overthought that one? Well, one, I, I, I watched this live yesterday and, you know, obviously I, I cover the Vikings a lot, but one of the main things I do is, is cover all these quarterbacks, mm-hmm. and, you know, in particular these young guys, everyone's really interested in these young guys. So I might do seven radio shows this week, just talking about quarterback play around the league. And again, in particular, these running backs. So I was really interested to see Josh Rosen play yesterday. What, what's a bummer, by the way, is, you know, you watch like the highlights on ESPN. They just throw the intercept. They just show the interception. Mm-hmm. He made about, I think he was probably four or six, something like that on that drive. He made four really nice throws uh, on that drive and a couple of them in the tight coverage. So he actually, I thought, played pretty dang well. Of course, you all know about the interception, which to me, there really wasn't a pocket there. It was the only place he could go with the football. He had to throw it. I think it was fourth down. Uh, and it was a play, you know, he had to sort of force it in there and obviously he got intercepted, but he played well. I do think that's probably the worst way, uh, to put your quarterback in the game. You mm-hmm. know, you, if it was an injury, it's different. You know, then it's like, Hey, you know, you went out there and, and, uh, that's what we had to do and had to make it happen. But, you know, when, when you have a healthy starter and a guy you chose in Sam Bradford, you know, the organization chose this guy to me. In particular, since the game was fairly close still, obviously very close, uh, this is a situation you get to sort of pick and choose when you put Josh Rosen in the football game, when you put your young guy in the football game, you know, putting him in against a very good Bears defense, you know, Cleo Mack and country uh, and company, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, to me, that's not the place mm-hmm. uh, to put your young quarterback in the game. And he played really well, actually. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's just a bad situation. Of all the teams, listen, the Vikings are, are, are struggling right now, but I'm telling you, they're far from the worst team in the NFL. There's a couple of really bad ones, and I believe the, uh, the Arizona Cardinals may be, you know, one of those sort of bottom five, uh, bottom five teams in the league. And they put their quarterback in a really tough situation yesterday. I don't like it, uh, as a guy who, 
uh, you know, always talks about quarterbacks and studies them and that feels like there's different ways to develop. To me, putting them in that situation is not the best thing to do for your quarterback or for your football team. Yeah, it's been it, it's been my take with Rosen. Let him sit this out, not because he couldn't play in the NFL, but because that team is not going to give him any help for this year. Yeah, so. I and mean, look at the difference between him and Patrick Mahomes. I mean, Mahomes yeah. sat out for a year, then yep. he gets put in with maybe the best offensive threats in the entire league. Yes. I mean, that's a you know completely different. This kid's putting it in, and you know he's got Larry Fitzgerald. You're 15. Right. And, and, you know, you got a good running back, David Johnson. But, you know, other than that, I mean, their old line was absolutely atrocious in the preseason. And uh, I don't think they're that much better in the regular season. And so, yeah, that team has a lot of a lot of issues and putting a young quarterback in there. That's uh, not, not all not all quarterback situations are the same. And definitely like, you know, Patrick Mahomes versus, uh, you know, this situation, Josh Rosen, very, very different. OK, throwing this out there. I think that you and I soon, after we get a little sample on this, need to do special episode where we only look at these rookie starters and first year starters because it's really captivated me from draft time. People on the podcast know that I was bringing on draft experts to talk, even though the Vikings weren't taking one, uh, to talk about how these guys could kind of reshape the league because there were so many good quarterbacks coming in in this draft class and we're already kind of seeing that. Yeah, and, and every year it's different. You know, some years it seems like there might be one guy that comes out that's going to shoot my year. And we're doing now. We're going way back in time, 2001. You had Michael Vick as the first overall pick. The next quarterback was Drew Brees with the first pick of the second round. Uh, you know, then after that, you know, no, nobody remembers most of the guys left over, right? So mm-hmm. it was sort of those two guys, and that was that was that year. This year we had, you know, obviously five guys in the first round. Four of them who uh, I, I believe maybe four have already played, uh, but the, you know, these guys are, these guys are playing and, and some of them are, are super talented. Some of, and they're all on different teams. You know, the jets have, the jets have no receiver core, really. Yeah. They don't have much for athletes around Sam Darnold. Uh, right. So they're all very, very different. Josh Allen, we saw him yesterday. He's so fun to watch. He's just sort of a, this incredible athlete. I remember watching him when he was at Wyoming, I believe it was versus the Nebraska corn Huskers. And he threw about a 45 yard, uh, uh, missile from, you know, sort of falling off of his back foot out of bounds to a guy in the back of the end zone. Just an incredible throw. Hmm. You're like, man, who is this kid from Wyoming? And uh, here is, here he is a couple of years later. He's super talented. He has a huge arm. Uh, you, you know, you obviously everything sort of went right for those guys, uh, you know, yesterday, but, uh, yeah, you, they, it is fun to really watch and break down these young quarterbacks in particular because it's not just like a one, week or one year thing Mm -hmm. you know it's interesting to see guys like Patrick Mahomes in year two you know Mitchell Trubisky now in year two and all that you know the sort of the situations around them again it's not like tennis where you can just blame the player uh the the discussion goes to what's around them what's on the other side of the ball you know should they be a game manager uh, versus a guy who just sort of lets it loose and becomes a gunslinger like a young Brett Favre I mean you know how do you train these kids how do you you know how do you try to maximize their potential because obviously if they're first-round draft picks, they do have plenty of potential. Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience this football season. Tons of TVs, legendary appetizers, amazing fresh half-pound burgers, handcrafted sandwiches, and a wide variety of other pub favorites. The drink menu is awesome, too. Huge selection of tap beer, handcrafted cocktails, and the best Bloody Marys in town. Seriously, these bloodies are awesome. Try the Bacon Bloody, the Jalapeno Bloody, the Mother Mary, or just get a flight and try them all. Plus, Lucky's 13 celebrates Sunday Fun Day, happy hour all day long on Sunday, every Sunday. Events and prize giveaways during games, too. Lucky's 13 has locations in Bloomington, Burnsville, Mendota, Plymouth, and Roseville. Having people over for the game? Call ahead to Lucky's and order some of those legendary apps, and they'll be ready to bring home when you get there. It's football time at Lucky's 13 Pubs. Find them online at Lucky's13Pub.com. Lucky's13Pub.com. It's the most wonderful time of the year, football time. And Lucky's 13 Pubs has you covered for the best game day experience. Lucky's13Pub.com. I'm going to miss Gruden uh, camps, though, and, and I missed them this year because that was one of my ways that I would try to use to figure out like who's going to work, who's not going to work. Because I thought he did a great job of grilling those guys and giving them enough criticism to see how they reacted to it, but also getting them on the board to see how they explain the game and out on the field. I thought that was a, that was a great resource, and Mahomes was one of my favorite episodes because he, see, he just seemed so young in it, but also seemed like a sponge. Like he was really engaged with what 
Gruden was saying and not pretending to smile on TV. And I just kind of really like that about him. It seems like that that part of it, the ability to sort of learn and be dynamic with the information and, and not feel like you know everything, that that's a huge part of the success with these young quarterbacks. Well, on, on top of it, you know, these guys have not, you know, the, <coughs> excuse me, on the Gruden thing, they haven't been in a camp yet, haven't, <coughs> they haven't been drafted yet. Mm -hmm. And so what's really interesting is also to hear, you know, when I talk to guys like, let's just say Kevin Stefanski, when I'm talking to him, the Vikings quarterbacks coach, about the guys who are coming out in the draft. What's really amazing is the variety of knowledge that these kids have, you know, from their college days. And this is not necessarily the player's fault. All right. All colleges are different. They mm -hmm. have different coordinators. Uh, there's a, a, a really wide variety of sort of, you know, advanced level offensive coordinators, quarterbacks, coaches in college. You know, recruiting and athletes are such a bigger deal in college. And the, the pros, it's the details of the X's and O's game and the strategy are so much more advanced. Mm -hmm. So you have a guy like, say, Mitchell Trubisky, which I had two or three of these sort of NFL uh, quarterbacks coaches say when Mitchell Trubisky came out, he knew very little about football. Mm -hmm. Like he, they did not have NFL concepts at all, you know, cover two beaters and blitz beaters and, and side adjusts and, and audibles. They didn't have any of that really, uh, at North Carolina. So he is like at a huge advantage from a guy uh, who say like Sam Darnold, who was in a fairly NFL style offense in college under center, you know, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, basically Sam Darnold has like three or four years, you know, probably three years of, uh, of training already uh, while, you know, Mitchell Trubisky is just learning how to be an NFL quarterback. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I remember with uh, Cam Newton that uh, John Gruden asked him to give him some language and he didn't have it. He just like, well, that's not how our play calls work. Our play calls are just 53 or whatever. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not these. And, you know, Gruden is famous for giving the guys the, the big, long play calls and everything like that. So. Well, then yeah, you have guys, yeah, they, like, you know, guys, NFL, you know, the NFL world sort of has its own thing. And you also have guys like Gruden, like not realize, you know, all these college offenses, they, they sort of, you know, they're building their offenses completely different. They don't have the, the helmet with the radio in it to call in the plays. Uh, you know, a lot of right. times it's look, look to the sideline and, you know, all these coaches are giving signals of what the plays are. They don't huddle nearly as much. Uh, there's sort of less run game with, you know, quarterback under center and play action. It's a whole different, you know, world. And so I think there's a lot of times where these, these NFL coordinators also could learn a few things from some of these college offenses who, mm -hmm. you know, seems like have a little bit, you know, a, li a little more creativity, uh, you know, in these college offenses. Well, Sage, uh, we will connect again in a couple days to preview the Rams. Also, we will get uh, on Wednesday to our journeyman quarterback of the week and i look forward to checking in on these on these young guys on a week-to-week -week basis with you because your perspective on these guys is awesome speaking of journeyman quarterback you got the assassin tonight uh ryan fitz magic yes we play playing yes. the steelers so one of my all-time favorites have, man maybe he'll have another great performance not but i tell you what as a journeyman quarterback he's made over 60 million dollars so uh, that's, he's had a pretty good, pretty good run as a journeyman. You know what, man? I'm starting to question his journeyman status, though. I mean, if he, if he is like thought of as the real quarterback, the franchise quarterback for a couple teams, if he convinces a couple teams he's the guy, I'm not sure he's a journeyman quarterback. I don't know. Well, the thing about a journeyman is when you play, you gotta play well, but then you also have to play poorly at times, too. So you have to be this sort of up and down <laughs> yes, guy. True. You know, Josh McCown played for like 10, 10 NFL teams that's or true. something like that. You also made a lot of money. So you have to be valued up, play, play well enough in streaky, uh, you know, uh, 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 stretches that teams go, wow, we need that guy either to be yes. our backup or even, even, uh, you know, try to compete for our starting job. And Josh McCown and, and Fitz Magic are, have been two of the best guys that haven't been sort of consistent starters, uh, you know, and had Hall of Fame type careers, uh, but have had great careers either way and the fun guys to talk about. And great guys, too. Everybody yes. loves those guys in the locker room. That is a key element, mm -hmm. a key element to being a good backup quarterback. Fitzpatrick is still legendary in Buffalo, especially with the media, for being one of the greatest guys to deal with of all time. So uh, I remember he invited one of the uh, reporters to his going away party from Buffalo. And I don't know if it was more than one or, or just one, but um, just just one of the uh, one of the all time great guys. And, and I've heard that about McCown, too. So 
you know it what? It seems like to me that seems like you know, Fitzpatrick. What his strength is is that it almost seems like he doesn't care, yeah, even though he yeah. completely does. Like he, com- yeah. he he cares about his guys and his team and trying to win. But other than that, he doesn't seem to care about anything. And for a, it's like the opposite of what you think of like this Harvard guy. Uh, that that's that's what makes Fitz magic so special. Yeah, uh, I was listening to Joe Thomas's podcast and he called it. Uh, he has he doesn't have a whole lot of gas. G A S give a not not appropriate yeah, for exactly. this podcast, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, you know what I'm going to start doing? Putting together a list of the uh, best journeyman quarterback seasons of the last 20 years. I'm going to start working on that so we can go over it. Um, Sounds good. Always great stuff, Sage, and thank you all for listening to this episode of the Purple Podcast. There's nothing more predictable in life than the unexpected. Lightning will always strike. Hail will fall on roofs. Fortunately, there's AAA. AAA has been helping members stay prepared for over 100 years. So when unusual storms, fallen debris, or sudden leaks happen, you'll be covered. Check, check, and check. Get an insurance checkup to make sure you have the home and auto coverage that's right for you. Visit AAA.com slash checkup or stop by your local AAA store. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. There is now a second sexual misconduct allegation against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh following Christine Blasey Ford's allegation dating back to their high school years. AP Washington correspondent Sagar Magani. Kavanaugh denies both allegations, calling the latest a smear, plain and simple. The White House blames it on a coordinated campaign by Democrats to tear down Kavanaugh. But the Senate Judiciary Committee's top Democrat says the most recent allegation is serious. Dianne Feinstein wants the Senate to immediately postpone any further action on Kavanaugh's nomination. Sentencing hearing for Bill Cosby begins today on his sexual assault conviction. Our Mike Sisak covered the trial. Cosby faces up to 10 years in prison on each of three counts. How much time will the 81-year-old actually get? Guidelines call for a sentence of about one to four years. AP correspondent Mike Sisak on the Cosby sentencing hearing. I'm Rita Foley.